morning, everybody. Glad you're here. This is the second Sunday of Advent, and so we're going to light um, the Advent candle from last week and this week's as well, which is on the theme of peace. So Phyllis is going to come before you sit down. Come on up. Do it now. <laughs> she was just about to sit down. <laughs> so last Sunday, we lit the first candle in our Advent wreath, the candle of hope. And we light it again as we remember that Christ, who was born in Bethlehem, will come again to fulfill all of, the prom- all of God's promises to us. The second Advent candle is the candle of peace. Peace is a word that we hear a lot. It is one of the things that we hope for. Christ brought peace when he first came to us, and he will bring everlasting peace when he comes again. The prophet Isaiah called Christ the Prince of Peace. When Jesus came, he taught people the importance of being peacemakers. He said, those who make peace shall be called the children of God. We light the candle of peace to remind us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and that through him peace is found. Peace is like a light shining in a dark place. And as we look at this candle, we celebrate the peace we find in Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, thank you for your peace. Thank you for this Sunday that we get to focus on that. And I just pray, Father God, that throughout this time together, we would sense your spirit guiding us, teaching us, and directing us towards the peace that passes all understanding. Bless this time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the bleak midwinter, frosty wind made In the bleak midwinter, in the times when the world feels cold and a little bit lifeless, we still have choices that we can make. 
When the world is hard and cold and water is like a stone, we can choose between being cynical and being hopeful. We can choose to be a cynic and just live in the moment and live for myself and I'll get what I can get because things are what they are and there's nothing you can do about it. But as a believer in Jesus, I choose hope. I choose hope because my hope is in Christ. Christ saves, Christ restores. And I have a reason to know that things will be right in the end because he is my hope and my hope has a plan. So when I choose hope, I have a choice to make. I can choose to struggle or I can choose peace. If I choose to struggle, I can try to make things happen under my own strength because, you know, I'm smart. I have power. I can make things happen. I can go on Twitter and tell people how to live and that the world will be better if they would just. But rather than struggling as a believer in Christ, I choose peace. I choose the peace of Christ because Christ is my peace. I can't fix the world. But God includes me in the work that the Spirit is doing in the world because my hope is Christ and my hope has a plan and I am part of that plan and that hope opens the door to peace. Our new sign language word for this morning is peace. <clears throat> Hands come together and sort of twist around each other and then let it go. Peace. This morning we light a candle of peace. Let's speak together the words that will be on the screen. We light this candle because we live in peace. We wake every day <clears throat> knowing what God has promised, that the child born for us will be born, will govern rightly, that he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. We light this candle because we live in peace. The peace and abundance of his kingdom will never end. He will reign with justice and truth forever, and he tells us, do not fear. We light this candle because we live in peace. God has promised, and his promises will be kept. And we light this candle because we live in peace. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your promises. We thank you for the ways we've seen your promises kept in the past and the ways that we know you well enough to know that you will keep the promises that we are still waiting to see completed. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As I thought about the theme of peace today, and I knew some of what Ruth was doing, I decided I would share a message that I've shared before. I'm not sure a few years ago, so if it sounds really familiar to some of you, hopefully it would be worth hearing again, but for a lot of you it will be new. And speaking of something familiar, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Peace on earth, 
goodwill toward men. Father, thank you for the timeless message of Christmas. And I pray, Lord, that as we look at um, what one very gifted person in history wrote about Christmas, that you would speak to our hearts and that we would come away from today with um, just a deeper sense of your peace. Lord, please give me the strength to do this. Please take this time. It's yours. Do whatever you like with it in Jesus' name. Amen. Christmas carols are an important part of the celebration of the Christmas season for all of us. And I'm sure each one of us has our favorites. And I bet over the Christmas season, you're kind of hoping, wishing, I hope we sing this song. I hope we sing this carol over the Christmas season. For many years, I, I loved Angels We Have Heard on High. That's been one of my favorites. Um, o Come, O Come, Emmanuel has been a favorite one of mine. The whole concept of Emmanuel, God with, with, uh, with us. I've always liked O Come, All Ye Faithful, but since Pentatonix came out with their version two or three years ago, I, I could watch that over, uh, their video over and over again because it's so full of joy. And lately, though, and over the last decade or so, I think my favorite Christmas carol has become I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Um, a number of years ago, I was at... Uh, Church on the Hill. It's because that's officially I still my membership is at Church on the Hill, and sometimes I'll get a chance to go there for different events. And they had a carol sing, and uh, so they're taking requests. And I said to the pastor, "Let's sing." I heard the bells on Christmas Day, and he's like, "I don't know that one." And he looked around everybody. says, pianist, do you know that? Nobody, nobody knew it. And so they got the hymnal out and they sang it and they played it. And when it was done, he pastor looked at me and said, "I think I have a new favorite Christmas carol." The words were written by the poet. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow on Christmas Day in 1864. So he wrote it at the height of the American Civil War, a great national tragedy. We, the, verse, the, the version that we sing now has five verses to it, but the original song, I believe, had as many as nine or more, and a number of the verses pertain specifically to the American Civil War, which is why we don't sing them anymore. The year before he wrote the poem, his son had been seriously wounded in the war. And a few years earlier, Longfellow had lost his wife in a tragic fire. So Longfellow's poem came out of a heart and soul that had experienced tragedy, both within his family and within the world around him. And yet in the midst of it all, Longfellow holds out a powerful hope found in the Christ child for whom the Christmas bells toll. First verse. I heard the bells on Christmas Day their old, familiar carols play. And wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Bells are symbols of proclamation. They make announcements far and wide. In about 25 minutes, we'll hear the bells from City Hall, Town Hall, telling us that it's noon hour. Um, when a wedding happens, bells ring out to, pro to proclaim the joy of the wedding. If I'm late getting here on a Sunday morning like I was today, and then I walk out my apartment, I'll hear the bells from St. Paul's Presbyterian Church. And one of my former youth, Andrew, plays the carillon bells there and plays carols and hymns. Actually, Christmas Eve, if you come to the Christmas Eve service, come downtown a little early. Service starts at 7, but start from 6 to 6.30, Andrew will be playing Christmas carols on the bells at St. Paul's to ring throughout downtown. It'd be really neat. And on Christmas Day itself, the ringing of the bells represents the joyous proclamation of the angels to the shepherds of the arrival of the Christ child, the good news of great joy that God had come to earth as a human, as a baby boy, the Messiah who would change everything from here on in. That glorious moment a glorious announcement of peace on earth, a gift given through God's favor and goodwill towards humanity, not, not through anything that we had done to deserve it. Their old familiar carols play. Christmas is a time to experience the familiar. It's why we hold so closely to the traditions that we lovingly and, and, and carefully repeat every year. We bring out the decorations that we've had for years and maybe even for generations. There's 
There's Christmas decorations on my parents' tree that belong to their parents. There are these familiar traditions. Uh, we used to do a youth drop-in. When I worked with Youth for Christ, we had a drop-in in this church basement that we did for many years. And, and um, I asked the kids to share some of their tr Christmas traditions. And I wasn't really expecting much because you got to understand these group of kids, it was like pulling teeth sometimes to get them to, to participate and, and be a part of something. But as soon as I asked for their Christmas traditions, they spent the next 20 minutes, one teen after another, telling us all about their family traditions and why it was so important to them. I think Christmas gives us a sense of the familiar because it gives us a sense of home, a sense of belonging. It's something that gives us an anchor in a world that seems to spin out of control. One of the most melancholy songs of, of Christmas, is, of, of the secular Christmas songs, is I'll Be Home for Christmas. Because it captures the memories of Christmas past and that desire for home, even if it's not possible to be there. What is it about this sense of home that's so tied to Christmas? I think it has to do with the fact that the arrival of Jesus signals to us, to all of us, that the way is open for us to go home to go home to God the Father. 2 Corinthians 5.21 reads, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The birth of Jesus marks the beginning of God's plan to bring us home, to make a way to deal with the sin that separates us from God the Father in heaven by making Jesus to be sin for us so that if we actively place ourselves, place our faith in Christ, our sins can be dealt with. And we can be reconciled to God and we can go home. I was watching a Christian movie last night on a DVD and um, there was a scene where this fellow who had uh, just been involved in a robbery snuck into the church to try to escape and ended up hearing the message of the gospel and receiving Christ, and he, after everybody else had left, he was still in the pew praying, and the janitor came up to him and talked to him a little bit, and as they parted, he turned to him and he said, welcome home. It was really kind of neat. But home is where we belong. We weren't made to live apart from God. The philosopher Descartes said that within every human heart is a God-shaped void. And Christmas, Christmas reminds us every year that Christ has come to fill that void, reminds us that we belong to God, reminds us of where home really is. And I think that may be part of that so-called Christmas spirit that even people who don't believe um, still feel at this time of year. They open their hearts to God just a little bit through Christmas, and, and he speaks to them, and he reminds them of home, home with him a place that is at the same time unknown and yet somehow familiar to them, a place of belonging that they may not fully understand but which can become incredibly real to them as they open their hearts to the Christ child. Second verse. I thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. The bells of this Christmas connect us to the bells of Christmas's past, all the way to the manger in Bethlehem. It's an unbroken song, for Christmas is eternal. Christ is eternal. His birth led to his, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Jesus lives, and his spirit active in our world impacts us daily and forever. The American preacher Chuck Swindoll, and I've quoted him a number of times with this, he has said that in one of his sermons that there are only two things that last forever, God's word and people. And to invest our lives in anything but those two would be to pour ourselves out for that which is not eternal. C.S. Lewis, the writer of the Narnia Chronicles, wrote that anything that is not eternal is eternally useless. Isaiah 48 Chapter 40, verse 8, tells us the grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of God lasts forever. Later in the same chapter, the Lord is described as a shepherd, tending his flock, gathering his lambs in his arms, carrying them close to his heart, loving and caring for people, living and proclaiming God's word. 
When these two things have priority, everything else falls into place. Christmas is eternal. The message of Christmas, the message of Christ, the good news of the gospel is an, indeed an unbroken song that has survived through the centuries, regardless of what humans might try to do to it. People have attempted to, to shove Christ aside amid celebrations of season's greetings and a holiday tree. The very discussion of the message of Christ is pushed out of the public square, an act of intolerance in the name of tolerance. The Bible has been banned and burned. Churches have been banned and burned. People have been banned and burned. Yet the message of Christmas, the message of the good news of Christ, rolls along as an unbroken song, proclaiming God's peace, proclaiming God's mercy, proclaiming his rescuing of fallen humanity, proclaiming his love that never fails. Third verse. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. In this middle verse of this carol, the hope of Christ comes face to face with the reality of life. It's the book of Ecclesiastes summed up in one stanza. For Longfellow, it was the horror of the Civil War and the tragedies that had beset his family. And in the century and a half since his poem, it seems like the world continues to spiral downward. Job 5.7 says that man, humanity, is prone to trouble as the sparks fly upward. And as a race, we never seem to learn. World War I, the so-called war to end all wars, marked the dawn of the most battle-weary century known to humanity. We always hope to learn from our previous conflicts, and yet a generation later, we find ourselves making the same mistakes, and thousands or even millions die. And we wonder, where is the peace on Earth? When the news is filled with stories of war and terrorist attacks and stories of Christians being attacked and killed for their faith, even if they don't always make the headlines. Where is the peace on earth when a small percentage of the world's population has so much while the majority has so little? When small sacrifices on the part of people in the first world can mean the difference between life and death for people in the third world? Where is the peace on earth when, when millions are enslaved by drugs and alcohol, experiencing only temporary peace following, followed by falling deeper into the abyss of despair, poisoning their lives and poisoning the lives of their loved ones and those around them? Where is the peace on earth when life is viewed so cheaply, when young men stab each other over silly arguments about being disrespected, when babies are killed before they even have a chance at the life that God has given them? It's hard to see the peace even in simple things, like, like people laughing at people who are hurting, I was talking about our youth drop-in before. One night, one of the youth uh, during our prayer time volunteered to, to pray for an aunt of his that was fighting cancer. And partway through the prayer, he was so choked up, choked up by what he was praying that he started to cry and began to sob uncontrollably, and his shoulders going up and down. And most of the youth were very sympathetic, but, but two of the kids started to laugh at him. And earlier, that very same night, I remember, there was a youth whose mom had died a couple of months earlier, and he came and told us that, that one of the other kids had, had made fun of and insulted his mom in front of him. We see it when we go to movies, when people laugh at scenes when the characters are experiencing emotional or physical pain or even being killed. We've become so desensitized to violence that I sometimes wonder if peace is even that important to some people. Hate is indeed strong and getting stronger. And God doesn't mess around when it comes to hatred. In 1 John 3.15, he says, Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. A selfishness that compels us to, to constantly look out for number one diminishes those around us. Everyone else then has to be number two or lower. And it makes them more susceptible to becoming objects of hate. 
And it seems that in today's Western world, Christian believers are becoming more and more objects of hatred. It should not surprise us. It's been happening to believers in other countries for, for centuries. And Jesus warned us in Matthew 10 that all men will hate us because of him. In John 15, 18, Jesus reminds us that if we experience hatred because of our faith, that we are in very good company. He says, if the world hates you, keep in mind, it hated me first. Hatred mocks. It mocks goodness. It mocks righteousness. It mocks God. James 5.20 gives the warning, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. There are times watching the news and hearing things, I just want to give society a good shake and go, what is wrong with you? Right is often seen as wrong, and wrong is viewed as right. Common sense and the wisdom of the ages is being turned on its head. You can walk into any bookstore and see books written by what are being called the neo-atheists, proclaiming in very harsh tones that religion and the very notion of God is a poison to society. Believers are called hateful bigots for, for holding to the timeless truths of Scripture, for taking Jesus at his word when he says that he, well, he is the only way to the Father in heaven. And I'm a news junkie, but i got to admit, there are times where I get so immersed in the news that I'm tempted to despair. And I just want to crawl under a rock or become one of those hermits and get a log cabin way up in the hills somewhere and just be on my own, look after myself, and let the world continue on its self-destructive path on its own without me. Anne Frank, in her diary, written amidst the horrors of Nazi Germany, wrote that she believed that through it all, most people are good at heart. Every human does possess, in some measure, the, what the theologians call the imago dei, the presence or the image, the image of God, no matter how faint that image may have been tarnished by sin. Still, when you look around, there are days when I'm truly tempted to despair, days when hope can be difficult to find, when peace on earth is the last thing that comes to mind. Fourth verse. Yet peal the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail. The right prevail with peace on earth, good will to men. Then peal the bells. Every year Christmas comes around like clockwork to remind us. Every day God's spirit works in our hearts as we allow him to remind us. He reminds us loud, calling out to us above the din of the evil and the hate and the sin. He reminds us deep speaking into our hearts and speaking into our souls and speaking by his Holy Spirit into our spirit where the world can't get at us. And through the message of Christmas, through the work of the Holy Spirit, we are reminded of this powerful and eternal truth. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. Nietzsche was wrong. The 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche famously stated once that God is dead. One of the coolest t-shirts I ever saw in a catalog, and I wish I had ordered it, had two lines written across the front. The first one said, God is dead, Nietzsche. The second one said, Nietzsche is dead, God. He has the last word. You can proclaim the death of God a million times over, but simply saying it over and over again doesn't make it so. Christmas begins a wonderful story that continues to the resurrection. Jesus was born of a virgin, lived, died, rose again, and scripture says is ever seated at the right hand of the Father. He lives. Jesus lives, and by his spirit, he wants to come and live in the heart and the soul of the man and the woman who will open their heart to him and surrender their life to him. God is not dead nor doth he sleep. Psalm 121 tells us that he who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. God will never be found to sleep at the switch. 
I like to say that the word oops is not in God's vocabulary. Nothing catches him by surprise. And those who have placed their lives in his hands can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that they are safe and sound, regardless of the craziness that might surround us. Isaiah 40, 28 and 29 says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Not only does he, he look after us and not sleep, but when the weight of this world begins to make us feel weary and tired and weak, he gives us the strength and the power that we need to go on, to put one foot in front of the other and face the world. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. There will be a day, Revelation 21 tells us, when God himself shall wipe away every tear from our eyes. A day when there will be no more death, a day when there will be no more mourning, no more crying, no pain. The old order of things will have passed away, and God himself, seated on his throne, will proclaim as clear as a bell, I am making everything new. It's a day to look forward to, for sure. But it's also a day that can begin even now. When we accept Christ into our lives, he gives us the deposit of his Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our lives as a guarantee of the eternal life to come. And we begin to experience what one hymn writer called a foretaste of glory divine. The world around us may still be a difficult and even a very tragic place in which to live. It may still bring pain and discouragement that may tempt us to despair. But that's all going on on the outside. The good news of Christmas is that we can be made new on the inside. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 20 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, it says. As though, as though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. If anyone is in Christ, then the right prevails. Righteousness prevails inside each of you. If we place our lives in Christ, then we have been reconciled to God through Christ. That relationship is restored, and the Father brings us home. The message of Christmas is peace on earth. And through Christ, everyone on the earth has the opportunity to be reconciled to God through Christ, the opportunity to find peace, the, the opportunity to come home. And God, the scripture says, has given us the ministry of reconciliation, the responsibility to be his ambassadors, pleading with those around us to get right with God and to find peace and to come home. The wrong shall fail and the right prevail as we go out into a hurting world and bring the hope of Christ to those living amidst despair. As ambassadors in this world, we bring others the hope of our new home. Having been, rec been reconciled to God through Christ, we now have a new home, a new citizenship. We're not of this world, and yet God leaves us here with a job to do to spread to others the ministry of reconciliation, to let others know that they can have an unbroken relationship with their Heavenly Father, to let them know that they can come home. And slowly, gradually, right shall prevail as people's hearts are made new in Christ. We like to think that changes in society can be done from the top down. 
But the truth is that lasting change in our society will happen. Wrong will fail and right will prevail, not from the top down, but when people are changed from the inside out. Changed from the inside out by the power of Christ, one person at a time. So don't lose hope. Beginning here and forever in eternity, wrong shall fail. We will be free from its influence, free from its tempting pull, free from its power. We will live in the light of God's righteousness forever. Now, if that sounds good to you, if every Christmas you get that sense of the familiar, a taste in your heart of home, but by December 27th it's gone, it doesn't last, well, it can last starting today, and it can last forever. Then ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill. To man, I thought how, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled. that Jesus offers us starts with the baby in a manger but continues on through his death and resurrection. And once a month we take time to, to focus in on what the death of Jesus means to us. Jesus came to bring peace on earth. And sometimes it's easy to think about it in general terms. Peace on earth. Peace to the whole population, to everything around us. But let's bring it home. Peace to me, peace to you. Peace in the middle of craziness that's going on around us, a peace that passes all understanding. 
He is our peace. He's broken down that wall of separation between us and God so that we can have peace with God. He's broken down that wall of separation between us and each other so we can have peace with each other. He's broken down that wall that prevents us from having peace within when we face difficult circumstances. Words will be on the screen. Let's sing this together. our peace we read a scripture earlier that said he became sin for us i was talking with a university student this week and she was asking about that that whole concept you know jesus we say sometimes jesus took our sin on his shoulders the picture of him wearing it but it goes even beyond that he became sin for us he became all the rotten things that we've done. He became all the horrible things that the worst people in history have ever done on that cross. And God, and then Jesus felt forsaken by God because God cannot look upon such horror of sin. But Jesus did that so that he could take the punishment for our sins so that we can know peace. The peace of God that passes all understanding. The peace of knowing that that when we welcome Christ into our lives and accept his broken body and shed blood for our sins, then we come home and we become the people that God created us to be. Let's take together this wafer that represents the, the broken body of Christ. Let's take together the, the juice that represents the shed blood of Christ given for us, paying the penalty for our sin so that we could know peace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you Jesus. Let's stand together. Let's sing again. He is our peace who has broken Broken. 
God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The Lord watches over you. You can cast all of your cares upon him, for he is and will be forevermore your peace. This week, may you find that in a very special way, in way, maybe in ways you've never experienced before. Cast all your cares, all your burdens on him, for he cares for you. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. May the peace of Christ be upon you now and forevermore. Amen.